Hi, Bill. Hello, Frank. Uh, very good to see you again. It's, it's Always been a, a pleasure to talk to you. It's been a, it's been a few few months since we last spoke. Um, our last conversation, I'm pretty sure, was with um, Noura Erikat, Diana Butu, and Daniel Makova about the International Court of Justice um, and uh, the South African case versus Israel. We'll come back to it because um, South Africa put another uh, request in front of the ICJ uh, a couple of days ago. But I wanted to start with um, the big news of the day, which is the International Criminal Court um, issuing, uh, not issuing, sorry, um, seeking an arrest warrant against Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, and uh, Gallant, the Defense Minister of Israel, as well as uh, three Hamas leaders. Um, mm -hmm. Before we, we get into details, uh, I wanted to ask you, how significant, in your opinion, is this? Because we have in the sort of pro-justice, pro-Palestine movement, been waiting for the ICC to finally make a stand or, or make the right decision when it comes to, to Palestine. But it, it, we felt it was never going to come. So um, how significant is this announcement by uh, Karim Khan? Well, Frank, I don't know. You must remember this now how many years ago, 13, 14 years ago, when I made a public call for an arrest warrant for Benjamin Netanyahu. And I got in a lot of uh, a bit of trouble for doing that. But uh, so it's quite gratifying to see that we're getting very close to that actually happening. Um, you know, it was very frustrating, the fact that Karim Khan not only waited a long time to move on the Palestine issue, but it was clear from people who were close to the court and from feedback that human rights activists were getting about the work of the court on uh, Palestine, that he was not really very enthusiastic about pursuing the issue, and that he was much more devoted to uh, investigating Ukraine. And of course, he was also, you know, arguably being influenced by the fact that wealthy Western governments were providing him with resources for Ukraine that they were not providing him for Palestine. And this is just a, a, a something, it's a feature of the ICC system that they allow for voluntary contributions from states. And that means that Wealthy states, essentially European, Western states, uh, will give money to distort the orientation of the prosecutor, whereas the states of the global south, well, they don't have a lot of money to give. They can't influence the prosecutor with resources because they, they're lacking them. So um, there are many, you know, we'll, we can be analyzing what was going on in the office of the prosecutor and Karim Khan for the last two, three years. But let's let's talk. Let's be optimistic and let's talk about the fact that finally something has happened and it's quite dramatic. And uh, he has also gone out of his way to demonstrate the support for it. So today there were two features of his announcement that I think are significant. The first is when he when he made the announcement, he was flanked by two I, I, I want to call them deputies, but they're not technically his deputies. The, the statute calls for deputy prosecutors, and there are two, two deputy prosecutors who's been, who've been elected by the Assembly of States parties. But he was not flanked by his deputies. He was flanked by the two people he's brought into the court to handle his investigations. One of them, uh, an American uh, prosecutor with a military background, and the other, a British prosecutor, also with a military background. Uh, so he brought in two military prosecutors from two of the most loyal friends of Israel. And they stood with him side by side while he announced that he was asking for an arrest warrant for Benjamin Netanyahu. And then he also referred to uh, the report of a panel of experts uh, that had, uh, who had been consulted. Now, this is also... I don't want to say unprecedented because I can't, you know, I can't rule out the possibility that in the past he has consulted informally with experts. It's not provided for in the Roman statute. 
but he, he, you know, he may have done this, but he's never done it publicly. No prosecutor. His two predecessors ne never did did either of the two predecessors ever describe a process of consultation, to my knowledge. This is the first time it's happened. Um, and they were all also, they were largely, I think, scholars, prominent lawyers, um, again, very Western, from the United States, from the United Kingdom. And, uh, and that, in a way, bulletproofs him against the charge that he's being anti-Semitic, that he's ganging up on Israel. As you know, Israel for, you know, always, certainly for many, many, as long as I can remember, for many decades, claims to be a victim of anti-Semitic persecution through bodies like the Human Rights Council. And they're dismissive of the UN, everything in the UN except the Security Council, where, of course, they have, a, they have an armed guard protecting them. And so they're not threatened. But everywhere else, whenever there's a, a resolution, the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council, the old Commission on Human Rights, critical of Israel, they dismiss it as being the work of, you know, activists from the global south ganging up on them. But it's pretty hard to do this time. And so, you know, uh, on the one hand, it would have been nice to see Karim Khan flanked by a lawyer from South Africa and from Nicaragua and from Libya and from the global south. In fact, he was he, he's he surrounded himself with 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 lawyers and experts from the West, but they're endorsing what he's doing. And so this is a I think a very positive development and he's he's insulating himself against the charge that he's he's picking on Israel. Thanks for this. Uh, this is um, enlightening. I, I didn't know this. Um, um, a common friend, Daniel, sent me this uh, report by the panel of experts. I recognize I recognize a few names in the in the the panel, but I didn't know this was quite unprecedented. So it's very helpful to know that. Um, before people don't understand how the ICC works, um, what are the next steps? So Karim Khan has now asked. So he's seeking an arrest warrant against five people so far. Uh, what's, what are the next step before the arrest war is actually given, in a way? Okay, so he goes before the pretrial chamber, three, three judges. Uh, the president of the chamber is a Romanian judge recently elected. She was formerly a member of the European Court of Human Rights, and she has two, uh, two other judges. It's a, it's a, very, it's a feminine chamber. Uh, one of them is Mexican, and the other is uh, from uh, Benin in Africa. And they will have to rule. Two out of three have to vote. You can have a you can have a dissenter on whether to er issue the arrest warrants. Um, one issue that they may address is whether or not Palestine is legitimately a state party to the Rome Statute. That's an issue that was already considered by another pretrial chamber uh, some years ago. And the pretrial chamber voted by two votes to one to recognize the legitimacy of Palestine's ratification or accession to the Rome Statute. But the new pretrial chamber is not bound by this. So in theory, they could review this. But I think given the volume of support uh, from this, from this uh, uh, you know, informal advisory committee, I think it would be very astounding if they were to to take a different view. I think that's very unlikely. And um, and so the, the next step will be they'll issue an arrest warrant. And then really nothing happens until the people are brought into custody, in theory. And, and that may take some time. It may never happen. Uh, one thing that the prosecutor is is experimenting with is a kind of a preliminary hearing called a confirmation hearing that can take place in the absence of the accused. And this is something that has, is provided for by the Rome Statute, but has never been used before. The prosecutor, Karim Khan, has indicated that he would like to do this, and he's actually scheduled such a hearing uh, in, the case, in the case of Joseph Kony uh, in Uganda, who, against whom an arrest warrant was issued 20 years ago. And he's never been apprehended. So they're going to have a hearing. And so I think it's quite possible that the prosecutor will do more of these 
hearings, assuming that this one works. It's scheduled for October, I think, of this year. And so it's possible that they'd have that. Otherwise, we may wait for him to be brought into custody. He's he's now the third head of government to be charged by the court. We have uh, we had uh, Bashir, Omar al-Bashir of Sudan, who was charged in 20, 2009, and he's still out there. He's 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 no longer in power, but he hasn't been brought to the Hague. We have Putin, who was charged a year ago, and who was just reelected. It's unlikely he'll be brought to the Hague in the foreseeable future. And now, quite likely, Benjamin Netanyahu. So it's it's an amazing development. Thanks, Bill. And and how? How does so first, how long do you think it's going to take the the chamber to come back with a decision? And secondly, um, how does it work in in practice? Is it um because Israel is not a signatory of the uh, Rome statutes, the u s isn't either. Um, uh, Russia isn't either. But is it a fact of Netanyahu can only be arrested if he gets on a plane and lands in France, London, or any country that is actually signatory to the Rome Statute? Or is it a fact when the arrest warrant is issued that the ICC has, has the power to actually go to Israel and arrest him? How, how does it work in, in, in practice? Well, in practice, we still, we're still dealing with sovereign states that control their borders. So the ICC is not going to send anybody to Israel, and if they do, they're going to be stopped at the airport. Um, so it won't happen that way. Um, in principle, if if Netanyahu and Gallant are charged and they travel outside of Israel um, and go to a country that's a state party, that state party will be under an obligation to arrest them. Now, I don't think Netanyahu and Gallant are going to go to uh, Qatar or to uh, Libya or to South Africa, but they might go to Europe. They might go to the United States. Um, if they go to Europe, they're they're essentially dealing with all the all the states in Europe are states parties to the Rome Statute. They'll be under a legal obligation to arrest them. So he won't go there. People speculate on whether they would comply with such an order. I think they will, but they're likely to tell Netanyahu, "Don't come here." They're not going to. They they won't wait to see him just show up at the airport. He'll he'll check ahead of time, and they'll say, "Sorry, you can't come here." But there are places he can come, and so he'll have no trouble flying to the United States, I would think. And the United States is under no obligation. Of course, the United States is, uh, you know, they're big hypocrites because they they uh, uh, praised, Biden praised the arrest warrant issued against uh, Putin. So they they like the ICC when the ICC goes after their enemies. When it goes after their friends, they condemn it and talk about it being instrumentalized, politicized, and all of this. But yeah, he'll be safe going to the United States, I suppose. But I think he's likely to stay home, and I think Gallant is, is as well. And that's, again, very interesting. Um, we've already heard from the US, Biden called the move outrageous. Uh, Blinken said he fundamentally rejected this uh, ICC. Uh, ICC. Uh, let's say ruling. Uh, the UK called it unhelpful, um, and, and this is like then because you were just saying states that are parties of, of the Rome Statute have an obligation, a legal obligation, to arrest Netanyahu if he does travel to to the UK, France, or, or Belgium. Uh, but then, are they going to do it? And that's the big question. And also, when we talk about the ICJ, people feel like. They should be, we should have a rule of law, but it looks like it only applies, as you said, to states and people that we are in the Western sort of world enemy with. So, so in a way, if he, if he does not, I remember actually General Almog, remember Almog when they had an arrest warrant against him. And I think the story was that he actually traveled to the UK and his plane landed. But he was alerted again by, I think, politicians, do not step off the plane. And I think the plane kind of refueled and he, and he left again. So what does this say to, to people, to the you know, international community? And when I say that, it's like the people about the rule of law, because it can be very disheartening and in a way maddening 
that there is a rule of law that only applies to, you know, the the global south or our enemies. Well, yes, that's the well, this is what we're seeing uh, in the last few years. Is this? I think it's quite marvelous, personally, because we're exposing the hypocrisy, and we're using international law as a a a a, a tool to a tool that can be used by the states of the global south to demonstrate that you know they're saying well you because the it's the states of the north the the icc is very largely a european creation i mean it has support from elsewhere in the world but it's very european it's very it's i don't want to call it an eu court actually in recent years it looked more like a nato court than an eu court but the fact is we hear all these we heard we heard biden talking about praising the icc for charging putin well, you know, the British, they shouldn't be saying such things. They're members of the court. They're supporters of the court. They pretty much always had a British judge on the court among the, amongst the, the 18 judges of the court. And when you have a court that operates independently, you have to respect that. You can't just dismiss it and condemn it. And what we have today is an indication of a court that's behaving in an objective um, balanced way, and of course, it bothers these hypocrites in London and in in uh, in New York and, and in Washington and New York. Well, you know, will that that's they just go, they're going to have to live with that. That's the result. On the one hand, they've always loved international justice. Take the British; they've always loved the International Court of Justice as well. They've used it in the past. Then sometimes it comes back and bites them which is what it did six years ago when it ruled that their, um, what they did to the Chagos Islands was contrary to international law, that they had to repatriate the people of the Chagos Islands to the islands, kick the Americans out, who've used it as a, as a military base for the last 50 years. They hate hearing that. But, but they use you know international law. This, this is the ambiguity of international law. On the one hand, it's been a, a created, it was created originally by colonialist states, European states, to assist them in their attempts to rule the world. But to the extent that they do it through judicial mechanisms, it comes back and people say, well, let's be fair, let's apply the law equally. And we start to see things that, that we've seen now. They're horrified at what South Africa's done in the court, what Nicaragua's done at the International Court of Justice. But finally, all Nicaragua and, and South Africa have done at the International Court of Justice is say, listen, you wanna have a rule that genocide is prohibited by international law? You have to respect it too. You can't be accomplices in it. You have an obligation to prevent it. And, and so that's what we're seeing. It's not like this is all gonna be resolved anytime soon. It's a, it's a, it's a battlefield, but today, was a you know was a a, a positive today was a, a minor victory on the battlefield. A, a quick a last question on the ICC. Uh, there's two there's been two critics that I've heard uh, from the Palestinians. One is of uh, both citizen, or you're also citing Hamas leaders, and the other one is that there's only Netanyahu and Gallant. There should have been a lot more people, you know, uh, in the sort of arrest warrant. What would you respond to these uh, two, two claims? Uh, yeah, on your second point, of course, the prosecutors left open the idea that there would be more. I have no doubt that we're dealing with a prosecutor who is doing this, uh, maybe reluctantly is too strong a word, but he certainly hasn't shown any enthusiasm for going after the Israeli leaders, but he's doing it. He's compelled by circumstances. He can't not do it without totally destroying his credibility globally, but he's it's not it's not as if he's he's done this step with with huge enthusiasm and so we'll see there are other leaders we'll see what happens we'll see how that plays out the other part what you called the the two did you say two sidism or one sidism uh, the the idea that we that both they, both i, I read this today both sidism yeah. yeah i i mean it's always been an issue of international justice this idea that you know, do you prosecute one side or do you prosecute both? And um, 
the answer has always been you can't compare both sides. That's why we go after one side and not the other because they're not comparable. But there are always objections, frankly, even when you go after both sides. It's not as if it's not as if the, the both sides are happy with what happened today. They're all saying you should have gone after the other side and not and not us. It's a strategic move by by Kareem Khan to do both at the same time. Um, and maybe maybe it will enhance the effectiveness. You know, global public opinion will decide whether the uh, the deaths of civilians, I think we're talking about uh, in in uh, on the 7th of October uh, of last year, uh, 1,100 and a few Israelis of whom 400, you know, more than a third were actually military or police. So they were combatants, technically. They weren't innocent civilians. But several hundred and uh, and a few hundred hostages. How to balance that with thirty five thousand um, deaths and huge numbers also of Palestinians who are maimed, children who've had their limbs amputated. You know, we'll we can weigh those as well. We can weigh that. Global public opinion will do it. We still don't know. We're, we don't know the truth. We don't know all the facts about what happened on the 7th of October. It's, it's, it's not un, without significance that the prosecutor has charged Hamas with um, crimes of sexual assault vis-a-vis -vis the hostages, but not there's no charge with regard to the 7th of October. And this is something it's been presented by Israel as being a, you know, a, a mass rape um, and, you know, there's there's new information that suggests that this is greatly exaggerated. And uh, you would think that if there was serious evidence that actually we'd see charges of it and we don't. So maybe out of all of this, we're going to get a more accurate uh, picture than what essentially Israeli propaganda has given us of what happened on the 7th of October. You know, I don't want to sound as if I'm dismissing some of the... Uh, some of the, the violence that took place on the 7th of October, but a lot of the description of it, and I still see it, I saw, it, you know, Arye Nair, the former head of, of Human Rights Watch, wrote a piece in the New York Review of Books um, that came out the current issue, I just received it, where he says he's ready to use the term uh, genocide to describe what Israel is doing in Gaza, but he uses some talk about the an, an adjective to describe the, the events of the 7th of October, I find a lot of these descriptions horrific and everything is there's a tinge of racism in it. It's the idea that Arabs fighting are breaking all the rules, whereas Israelis are just committing ordinary war crimes uh, with a little. And, and, you know, people don't use these terms horrific in the same way. Um, so I, 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 I'm waiting to, you know, I have an open mind on this. I want to I want to get to the truth. And one of the things that happens when they have to present evidence before judges is give us the real evidence. So we'll see. We'll see what Kareem Khan has. I think the whole world knows about starvation, for example, because Gallant was the man, he's the man at the very beginning who said, we're going to starve them. And they're starving now. So he's being charged with it. So this is justice. Okay. So um, before we go, I want to go back quickly on the ICJ. So South Africa went back to the court and asked the court for more measures, mainly because all the measures they've asked for in January, February were not respected and actually quite the contrary. They were completely mm. dismissed and Israel, in a way, pretty much bragged about doing completely the opposite of respecting these measures, um, which involved um, getting immediate access to humanitarian aid. We've seen what happened with that. Um, so now, uh, the, you know, the South African team went back to the ICJ, gave another incredible presentation. Um, Israel responded the day after, and once again, in my opinion, made, made a mockery of the court, didn't give any legal argument, just threw more propaganda, uh, said stuff like, Israel takes extraordinary measures to protect civilians which is so, I mean, it's, it's, in a way it's laughable, but it's also so infuriating because it's, 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 you know, parallel worlds and they know they're not taking measures to protect civilians. But 
if I understand correctly, now the South African team is asking for a ceasefire, like a cessation of, of not hostilities, I think it's a cessation of the armed aggression on, on Rafa. Um, the call is supposed to come back quite soon about this, maybe towards the end of the week. What's your, in a way, pronostic from yeah. friends, uh, uh, other friends, uh, telling me that they think they, the call is going to come back with a, a call for a ceasefire, but it might be very close in terms of the of the judges. Um, so what's your pronostic? And then finally, the next step, I guess, would be to go back to the UN Security Council for a resolution if they ask for a ceasefire. And what's the, the likelihood of, of such a resolution passing, uh, you know, which means without a US veto or, or something? I, you know, Frank, I don't like, I can't predict these things. I, I'm not a, a fortune teller. I realize there were, there were arguments on both sides. Let me just say about what's happening in the South African case is that actually, as you said, you know, Israel didn't respect the previous orders from the court. But technically, although the, the South Africans are, are also asking the court to, to, you know, to make some ruling about how Israel's failed to comply with the orders of the court, that's not really the basis for going back to the court for a new order. The basis for going back for a new order is that there's a significant change in circumstances that compels a new order. And what South Africa is saying is we are now, and they use terms like we're now in the end game. We're now at the end of this. They're, they've, they've driven the Palestinians in Gaza into the south. They've cornered them. Um, and now they're telling them to move because they're going to destroy the last place where there are hospitals, where they're capable of living. So this is really, um, really dire. But how the court will respond, I can't, I can't predict. But, you know, the court treated this as a matter of great urgency. They, they convened it within a few days. And, and I think they appreciate the gravity of it. Maybe if, if I could say, because I think we're just about at the end here, but if I could just add a point that something that is missing in the debate and missing in the um, in, in the submissions by the prosecutor today is the West Bank. Um, and this is important. Um, for years, the the efforts to persuade the prosecutor to begin prosecutions with regard to to Israel was very largely based upon the issue of settlers moving into an occupied territory, which is a war crime, which is in the Rome Statute, and the hope that that issue would be addressed as well. Of course, the situation is dire in Gaza, and maybe it sounds you know, like a distraction to talk about the West Bank as well. We're talking about famine in Gaza. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a nightmarish, horrible situation. But we shouldn't lose sight either of the of the West Bank, and the prosecutor should be issuing charges as well with regard to the whole pol policy of the settlers and the settlements and and all of this, which is also in terms of the the long term survival of the Palestinian people is is decisive as well. It's part of the whole genocide debate. Um, it's you know Israel's policy is not about destroying Gaza but leaving the West Bank alone. It's about it's about an Israel that goes from the river to the sea. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, this is a crucial point, and I'm so glad you addressed it. Um, but I guess you know today we'll take what we can take. It's a it's a it's a small victory, but I guess I don't know if it's a small victory. Yeah, I don't know if it's a victory yet, but it's it's a for people that have been involved on the issue for many years, it seems like a, a quite a, a groundbreaking break breakthrough in a way. So. Let's see what, what's going to happen in the next uh, few weeks. Yeah, how long do you think the court, like the chamber, is going to take to come back to the decision? Is it, yeah. Well, I would think that, that we're talking about a matter of weeks. Hmm. I think it's probably a matter of weeks, but uh, okay. it could take longer. It depends how quickly they work and how much material they have to examine. It shouldn't take too long. Sometimes they move very quickly, and hmm. sometimes they take a long, long time. Um, I think when they take a lot of time, it's generally because there's no sense of urgency. Here, clearly, there's a sense of urgency and a desire. We never know how how these these initiatives work in terms of deterring conduct. But the situation in Gaza is dire. 
and it's urgent. And so hopefully the judges of the pretrial chamber are going to uh, have the same sense of urgency that the judges of the ICJ have shown in ruling on the issue. Let's hope. Thanks a million, Bill. Thanks again. Nice to talk to you. Thanks, Bill. Bye-bye.